Well, good morning, everybody. Man, it's so good to see you here today. Glad that you've come to worship with us, and uh, what a great day. What a great day to be here worshiping with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we are in week six of our series called God is Good. Uh, we're taking an in-depth look of Psalm 23, uh, undoubtedly the most famous passage from the Bible. And we're looking at six ways that God wants to show his goodness to us as we allow him to be our shepherd, as we surrender our life to him. So let's review what we've learned so far, starting with verse number one, the Lord is my shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? He leads, he feeds, and he meets needs. He leads, he feeds, and he meets needs. I will not be in need. How many needs do you have today? Well, if the Lord is your shepherd, the answer is zero because he is meeting all of those needs in your life. He lets me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. And those are two metaphors to help us understand how the Lord wants to refresh us and bring us rest. You know, life can be exhausting sometimes. Life can be exhausting. And so what the Lord does as our shepherd is he leads us to those places of rest and refreshment when we need that strength, when we need um, that recovery from just the exhaustion of life. And then verse number three says, he restores my soul. What is your soul? It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's where you think, it's where you feel, and it's where you make your choices from. And so what happens is, in life, our soul gets damaged. There are many things that can damage our soul, but we talked about the top three that, that I think, just my opinion, one being grudges. When we hold a grudge against someone, when we are bitter uh, towards someone, that damages our soul. Uh, two being guilt, when we're carrying guilt, whether it be um, false guilt or whether it be true guilt, we, we learned how to handle that guilt in our life. He restores our soul. And then three being grief. Life is difficult sometimes because of the grief that we experience when we experience loss in our lives. And so, but the Lord comes along and he restores our soul. <clears throat> and then it says this, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. You know, life is a series of choices. We talked about this last week. We make our choices and then our choices make us. And what God wants to do is he wants to come alongside you and guide you. He wants to help you make the right choice. When you come to a fork in the road, he wants to lead you down the right path. So that kind of brings us to today. And we're ready to look at the next benefit of allowing him to be our shepherd in life. And, and here it is. It's verse number four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, the valley of the shadow of death isn't talking about death itself. It's talking about the dark times in your life. There are moments in your life where you feel like everything is closing in around you and you feel like you're dying. You feel like you want to pray the prayer, Lord, this will be a good time to just go ahead and take me out of here. Just go ahead and, get and take me home. You know, as I was putting this together, this message together this last week, uh, my mind went back to when I was a kid. And my grandpa and I, we used to watch a sitcom called Sanford and Sons. Anybody you remember that show? Sanford and Sons, and, and I loved watching it with my grandpa. It was hilarious uh, back in the day. It's funny how how humor changes as culture changes, but it was so hilarious. Anyway, uh, Fred Sanford, you know, he'd hear something that was distressing and he'd grab his chest and he'd stagger around and he'd say, it's the big one, I'm coming to join you, Elizabeth. Anybody remember that? Yeah, for those of you that are millennials and you're like, what in the world is he talking about? If you see this meme on any of your social media, then you'll understand where it comes from now. I had a few of these moments yesterday during the game. How about you? Yeah, yeah. Seriously, though, life can be hard. And there are moments where we just don't feel like we're going to make it through. 
We just don't feel like we're going to make it through. And, and if you're here this morning and you're in one of those moments today, one of those valley of the shadow of death moments, I've got some good news for you. The good shepherd wants to lead you through it. He wants to walk you through. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to, he's going to take your hand and he's going to lead you right through it. And this is a metaphor to help us understand that. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What's he talking about here? It's kind of difficult for us to understand this whole metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep, simply because we're so disconnected in our culture. Uh, we don't have any shepherd that I know of, shepherds that I know of that are, that are a part of our congregation. Uh, maybe you're visiting today. Are you a shepherd? Any shepherds in the house? No, nope, I didn't think we had any shepherds in the house. So sometimes it's difficult. So let me kind of give you some context here to help you understand exactly what the Bible is trying to communicate with us. How does a rod and a staff comfort us in our times of distress. What does this symbolize? Okay, let's look at it here real quickly. This is, this is a rod that the shepherds would carry with them when they were shepherding the sheep. It's relatively short, it's about two feet long, and it's a, it's a club-like device. It's a defensive tool that the shepherd would use to keep the predators away from the sheep. Predators like wolves and bears and mountain lions. You see, sheep are defenseless animals. Uh, they don't have claws to protect themselves. They don't have sharp teeth. All they do is chew on grass all day long, you know? And, and, and they can't run very fast. They can't escape a wolf or a bear or a mountain lion. So the shepherd would watch over the flock and he would be on the lookout for predators that would try to sneak in and steal a sheep. And so if he would spot one of those, he would, he would grab his club out of his belt and he would go chase it off. He would, he would run that predator off and keep the sheep protected and keep them safe. So it was a defensive tool that he used. And then the other tool that he used was called a staff. And the staff was much longer than the rod. Matter of fact, the staff was usually about as tall as the individual was. And it was, it was much thinner. And on the end, it had this little crook, and then it would have a little hook right down here. So what, what do we use this for? Well, sheep have a tendency to wander off, don't they? They have a tendency to get into things that they shouldn't be into. And so sometimes when they were out to pasture, maybe they would get uh, caught in a thorn bush. And so the, sh the shepherd would notice that and he would go over there and he would take his staff and he would use this crook to help guide the sheep out of the thorn bush. Sometimes they would be on a slope and pasture and sometimes they would get a little too far down the slope and it wasn't safe for the shepherd to be able to go down there and bring them back. So he would use this staff. He would reach down over the, over the hill and he would, he would help them. He would either grab them by the hind leg or maybe grab them by the neck and help guide and direct them back up the hill. Bring them into safety, basically, is what he would do. So that's how... The shepherd used these two instruments to help protect and to help guide the sheep. You may want to write this down because this is exactly what the Lord wants to do in your life. He wants to protect you and he wants to direct you. That's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to protect you and direct you. So this is your first fill in the blank right here. If you're taking notes this morning, and I hope that you are, the rod represents power and authority. In other words, as long as that shepherd, that shepherd may not be able to fend off that mountain lion by himself, but as long as he had that rod, he was in control. He was in authority, and he was protecting those sheep who were helpless. And the staff represents care and compassion. When the sheep would get in trouble, the, staff, the, the, the shepherd would use the staff to help them out of trouble. Now, what does that mean for you? How do you get comfort out of that? Well, let's look at the words of Jesus. He said, I came so that my sheep will have life. And so that they will have everything 
they need. Now, I want you to underline that, underline that, my sheep. It's very important that you understand that. Being in the flock, Jesus came so that my sheep will have life, and they will have everything that they need. Look at what he says next. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know, all throughout the Bible, sheep are a symbol of God's people, and the shepherd is a symbol of God himself. And so Jesus comes along, and, and, and he says, he continues with this metaphor, and he says, I came that my sheep, the people that are in my flock, the people that are following me, that are letting me lead them, I came to give them life and to give them everything that they need in life. That means everyone that joins Jesus' flock can expect this, can expect Jesus to do, that, do this for them. And if you have a hard time believing that Jesus will do this for you, just take a look at the cross. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for you in order to protect you, in order to direct you. He died on the cross so that he could get those gifts to you. Now, I want us to look at the words of Jesus this morning. We're only going to use the words of Jesus this morning for our guide from this point forward. And um, it's the red letter in most Bibles, right? You look at the red letters, that's what, that's what Je- those were Jesus' words. So here's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. How does Jesus treat his sheep? So we've got this, we've got this metaphor of the rod, he's going to protect us. We've got this metaphor of the staff, and he's going he's to guide us. What does that look like? How does Jesus treat you as one of his sheep. Well, number one, there are five of them this morning. Number one, here's what we see. If I bring my hurts to Jesus, he will show me compassion. You see, when I come to Jesus and and I say, God, I am hurting. God, I am anxious. God, I am distressed. God, I've gotten into trouble and I don't know how to get out. When we bring him our hurts, listen, he doesn't scold us, he serves us. That's what he does. He doesn't put you down, instead, he lifts you up. Here's how the Bible puts it right here. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. They were in trouble. They were hurting, and Jesus came along, and he had compassion. And I want you to understand, that's the way God looks at you when you're hurting in life. It's more than just sympathy, because sympathy says, I'm really sorry you're having to go through this. And there's a place for sympathy. It's sharing the feeling or the thought of a brother or a sister in Christ. There's a place for sympathy, but but this is more than sympathy. Jesus didn't just have sympathy. He had compassion. And the Bible says repeatedly that when Jesus looked at people who were in pain, he was moved with compassion. What does that mean? Compassion means I will do anything within my power to stop the hurt that they're going through. That's what compassion does. Compassion is action. Sympathy is feeling and thought, but compassion is action. And what Jesus says here is is he was moved with compassion. In other words, Jesus says, I'm going to do everything within my power to help you, to serve you. See, with Jesus, when he came to earth, he came for you. He died For you, it was all about you. From God's point of view, it was all about you. God is unselfish. And just a side note here, when we come to Jesus, he teaches us how to have compassion like he had. We begin begin to follow him. 
And we understand that, that, that this, is what, this is how we're supposed to live because we're his sheep and we're following him. Take a look at this. For even the Son of Man came not to serve, or, or not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. How do you show compassion? Underline these words. You serve and you give. That's how you show compassion. How do you know when you're moving past sympathy with an individual it's because you're stepping up and you're serving that individual. You're stepping up and you're giving to that individual. That's what compassion is all about. He came to show compassion. And that's exactly how he leads us. When, when we receive Jesus Christ, we realize the unselfishness of God, that he would give everything that he had in order to save us. And then he leads us down that same path. He teaches us how to have compassion. And so we serve him. And we give to him, we serve people, and we give to people. He's just leading us that way. So when I come to Jesus with my hurts, he doesn't scold me, instead he serves me. He doesn't hassle me, instead he helps me, okay? Second, if I choose to follow him, Jesus leads me in the right direction. And we talked at depth about this last week, but I just want to mention it here as well. Jesus isn't going to lead you in the wrong direction. He's always going to lead you in the right direction. And so when you come to God and you say, you know, I'm following your son Jesus and I want him to be the guide for the rest of my life, everywhere he leads you is going to be the right direction. It's going to be the right path for you. I don't know if you ever have taken a guided tour maybe of a city um, or a historic building or a cave, something like that. But if you have, you realize that you experience and you learn a whole lot more than just trying to figure it out on your own. When you have that guided tour, that person that's been there, that person that has the experience, that person that knows which way to take you. And that's what we have to understand about Jesus. He wants to, he wants to come alongside us and give us a guided tour on life. He wants to lead us in all the right paths, in all the right directions. If you're just walking through life on your own, I want to tell you, you're missing a lot. You're trying to figure all this out on your own, and you're trying to figure out which hallway should I go down now. And, 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 but the thing about Jesus is he's going to say, no, let's go down this hallway first. We can get back to that hallway later, but let's go down this hallway first and, and, and see, what's, see what's down here for you. You need a guide who's been there. You need a guide, someone who is more experiencing, experienced than you, so you don't pass by all this stuff that's for you. God wants to give into your life. Jesus says, follow me. Let me be your guide. Let me show you around in life. And as a shepherd, he knows more than his sheep, right? Like a shepherd knows way more than the sheep. Sheep are just dumb, dumb animals. Jesus is always going to know more about your life than you know about your life. He's always going to know more about your life than you even know. And I know that sometimes that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. But he has created you. God has created you deeply and intimately with purpose for being here. And there are going to be moments in your life you don't have a clue. There are moments in my life I don't have a clue. And I'm so glad that I've got a shepherd to say, Lord, you created me with purpose and you know the direction and the path that I need to take right now. So I'm just going to follow you. Man, talk about the weight being lifted to know that he's going to lead me in the right path. He knows way more about my life than I know about my life. In John 10, verse number four, again, the words of Jesus, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And I want you to underline that phrase, goes ahead. In shepherding, the shepherd always goes first. Why? Because he's leading the sheep. He's not driving the sheep. He's not behind them, pushing them. 
You know, you drive cattle, and and that's probably uh, a metaphor that we would understand more than like herding sheep, right? Because, you know, where we live and stuff, we we understand what cowboys do, right? We watch Yellowstone. (laughs) We understand what cowboys do. They they drive sheep, you know, and drive sheep, drive cattle. But I want you to understand a shepherd gets out in front and he leads the sheep. And there's a big difference between the two. When you're driving cattle, you're in the back and you're pushing them forward. You're pushing, you're, you're pushing them. And I want you to understand that's not how Jesus treats you. He doesn't push you. He leads you. He's not going to push you into things that you don't want to do. He's not going to force you into anything. He's simply, he's simply going to get out in front and say, follow me. Follow me. And if you'll follow his lead, I want to tell you, your life is going to be so much easier to handle. I'm not saying you're going to have an easy life. I'm going to say it's going to be easier to handle if you'll let him lead. And it'll be so much more rewarding and so much more full than if you're in charge. Because you're missing a whole lot when you're not let Jesus guide you and direct you. So if I choose to follow Jesus, he always leads me in the right path. Life is fuller when I choose to follow Jesus. I know what you're thinking, but what happens when I don't, right? What happens when I wonder? What happens when I step out of the flock? Well, that's the next on the list. If I get confused and wander off, Jesus finds me and brings me back. We're all going to wander from time to time. And Jesus had some very specific things to say about this. Look at this. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out and search for the one that is lost? Now, that's a rhetorical question, right? The answer is an obvious, well, of course. That's what shepherds do. Why? Because every sheep matters. You matter to God. And so when you wander off, guess what happens? Jesus comes looking for you to bring you back. That's what, that's what that staff is all about. God doesn't go, or Jesus doesn't go, well, at least I've got, still got the 99. No, no, no. no. How many of your parents, let me see your hands, your parent. What happens when your child wanders off at a ball game or in the mall? You look around and you go, where's Johnny? Do you go, well, at least I still got the other two. <laughs> no. No, you, you stop. You stop everything until that child is found. He is number one priority until you find that child. And what do you do when you find him? You get your sternest voice and you say, you can't do that. You correct him, don't you? You correct him and if he's done it time and time and time again, you may go into some discipline, right? And you may, and the rod, here comes the rod. And you, and you may discipline him for that. You discipline your child. Why? Why do you discipline your child? Because you love that child. That's why you discipline your child is because you love that child. An undisciplined child is an unloved child. A kid that gets his way all the time and does what he wants to do when he wants to do it is an unloved child. Now, let's use this analogy in your relationship with God. What does God do when you wander off? He finds you. And what does he do when he finds you? He corrects you. And if you just are constantly wandering off, and he's constantly have to go and find you, the next step may be a little bit of discipline. Look at Psalm 119. 
The psalmist wrote, I used to wander off until you disciplined me, right? You ever, you ever feel that way in your relationship with God? I used to be a wanderer, but I figured out that wasn't the best thing to do. That wasn't the best way to live my life. I used to wander off until you disciplined me, but now I closely follow your word. You are good and do only good. So teach me your decrees. Discipline, what does that correction do? It spurs something on the inside of you. You, you, you realize that he's leading you in the right path and, and you're just, you just keep on wandering off and now you're experiencing all the consequences of, of wandering off. You're being disciplined. But all of a sudden it clicks and you go, you know what, it'd be a whole lot easier if I just follow him to begin with. That's what the psalmist is saying. Right here, that was his experience in life, and that'll be your experience as well in your wanderings. Do you realize that many of the problems in your life are preventable? M many of the problems that, that we encounter in life are preventable problems. And how do we prevent them? We let the good shepherd teach us his principles, and his ways for living. We learn, don't we? We learn, man, I don't want to do that again. Lord, teach me. What can I do differently? That's obviously the wrong path. Lord, show me the right path so that I can take it. So when I get confused and I wander off as a part of his flock, Jesus finds me and he brings me back. And just know that if it happens over and over, there's probably going to be some discipline involved. Why? Because he loves you. Because you're his child. That's why the discipline is there. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us if you can continually live in sin and not experience the discipline of God in your life, you're actually not his child. Did you know that? We could go deeper in that, but I don't have time this morning. But if you want to start a conversation, let me know. You can email me. Number four, if I fail or fall, Jesus rescues and recovers me. Like all sheep, we not only wander off, what do we do? We stumble and we fall. We are clumsy. We are clumsy. How, how does Jesus react to our clumsiness. You know, what are we talking about? What I'm talking about is when we, when we do something and we go, why did I do that? Right? You say something, you're like, why did I say that? I know I shouldn't have said that. That's, that's, I'm not following Jesus' lead by saying that or doing that. Why, why did I do that? Why? It, we, we fall. We flub up. We make mistakes. Well, let's look at the word of Jesus. How does he handle these situations when we're his if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Another rhetorical question, right? Well, of course you will. Then how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Think about it this way. Let me, let me say it this way. If you were, as, as, a, as a sheep of Jesus, if you were walking down the street and there's construction happening and and you're just you know you're just being a sheep you're just being clumsy and you don't see the six foot deep hole in front of you and you just boop, walk right off in into it now what do you do what do you think what's the first thing that you think well if you were a buddhist you would think well it's karma i'm getting paid back for all the things that I've done to people, that's what you would think, that this is, that, that's what happens. You fall in pits because it's karma. If you're a Hindu, you, you might think, okay, here I am. Is the pit in me or am I in the pit? If you're new age or you're self-help people like the majority of people in culture are today, you would think, I can get out of here. I can do this on my own. I am powerful. But as a Christian, you're in the herd 
and Jesus is your shepherd, what is your first thought when you fall into that pit? Help me, Jesus. Get me out of here. And you know what he does? He comes over and he uses that staff and he reaches down in there and he helps you out of the pit. That's what Jesus does. Help me. Help me get out of this. And guess what? He shows up and he does. That's what happens when we fall in to a pit. Jesus helps us out of that pit. He becomes our savior. Okay, last. If I trust him to save me, Jesus keeps me saved. I just wanted to throw this in there because I think it's very important for us to understand this. There are some people, some Christians, that think that you get saved and in the moment that you make a mistake or you fail, you're unsaved. And then you got to come back and get saved again. And then you're unsaved the moment you make another mistake. And then you got to come back and you got to get saved again. So consequently, from day to day, you don't know whether you're saved or not. You're always worried about your salvation. I, I get this a lot in, in, in premarital counseling. One of the questions on, to get to know the people that I'm, I'm, I'm going to marry. One of the questions is, is, is um, are you assured of your eternal salvation? Do you have confidence that you're going to heaven? And I will tell you that the majority of the time, it's either I hope so or I don't know. And these are Christians. I want you to understand that if, I, if you trust Jesus to save you, he keeps you saved. You don't lose your salvation the moment you flub up, the moment that you make a mistake. Here's how Jesus said this. My sheep, Listen to my voice. How do you know you're a part of the herd? You're listening for his voice. I know them and they follow me. How do you know, once again, you're a part of Jesus' sheep? They follow. They listen and they follow. Now, does that mean every single time, every single time we're going to follow? No, there are going to be times that we fail. There are times that we, be, that we miss the mark. But that doesn't change things. Keep reading. I give them eternal life, and they will never die, and no one can steal them out of my hand. My Father gave my sheep to me, and he is greater than all, and no person can steal my sheep out of my Father's hand. You know what that tells me? It's not my job to keep myself saved. That's the good shepherd's job. It's God's job. What's my job? My job is to put my hand in the Father's hand. And my job is to simply listen and follow. That's salvation. That's salvation right there. When I put my hand in the Father's hand, and when I say, God, I'm I'm, I'm all yours, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I know I could never earn heaven because it's perfect and I am not. And I am accepting your gift of salvation. I'm accepting what Jesus did on the cross as payment for my sin. I'm accepting your son as my savior, and I'm putting my hand in your hand. And I want you to understand that eternal life begins the moment you do that. You don't have to wait until you die to figure out whether you're saved or not. Salvation happens the moment you put your hand in his. That's when you start living eternal life. And that's why Jesus said, anyone that will do that will experience life and life to the full. You'll experience life today and tomorrow and next week and next year and when you die or Jesus returns, whichever happens first. 
You don't have to wait until you die to find out whether you're saved or not. Satan can't steal your salvation, your failures and your faults can't steal your salvation. Your eternity began the moment you started listening to him. You put your hand in his, you started listening to him and loving him. And your salvation will continue for eternity. So as we wrap up this morning, I just, I just want to ask you a very important question today. Who's your shepherd? Who's your shepherd? You know, a lot of people shepherd themselves. They follow their own instincts in life. They, they listen to themselves and love themselves. They trust only themselves. They put themselves first. And if that's you, that, if you're here today, I just want to ask you a question. How that, how's that working out for you? Because it may work for a little bit, but I want to tell you it'll come to an end quick. When you're your own God and you control your own destiny, why not trust the good shepherd, the one who gave his life for you, the one who's promised to lead you in the right direction, the shepherd who has said, has promised, look, when you fail, I'll help you out. The shepherd who died for your sins so that you could have eternal life. I want to tell you, you're not going to find a better shepherd than Jesus. Matter of fact, in the Bible, we've been referring to him as the good shepherd, but there's one passage in the Bible that refers to him as the great shepherd. He's the best. He's the one that you need in your life to forgive you of your past and to lead you into your future. Jesus is the one for you. So I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Close your eyes, and we're just gonna spend a moment in prayer before we leave today. Jesus, thank you so much for guiding us. Thank you so much for guarding us. Lord, if there's anyone that's here today that, that hasn't put their hand into yours, I ask you to speak to them through your spirit and invite them, invite them into the, invite them into the flock. May they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit say, come. And today be the day that they find you as their savior and as their shepherd. So with your heads bowed, with your eyes closed, I want to lead you in a prayer this morning to accept Jesus as your Savior, to make him the shepherd of your life. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I hear you inviting me to take your hand and never let go. So here we go. I ask you to be my Savior and shepherd me from this day forward. Come into my life. Teach me to hear your voice and help me to follow you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>